it's great to be back at Greenbelt this year. And this year, I wanted to uh, just share some thoughts about reading the Bible, because it seems to me that the way that we are in the church right now, the way that we read the Bible together is uh, one of the most contentious issues that we're having to face together. So I've called this talk, Reading the Bible with Your Feet. So however often you might go to church, whether you go most Sundays or whether you go uh, for a wedding or a funeral and you sit there and you hear the reading, how often do you hear that reading and you think, really? I do not permit a woman to teach a man, says St. Paul. And Jesus said, to those who have little, even what they have shall be taken away. Happy are those, says the psalmist, who seize your children and throw them to the rocks. Jesus tells a story which ends, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the darkness where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Really? Do I have to sign up to this? Is this what it is? And then later on, watching the news and seeing the violence done in the name of all kinds of religion, do you think, isn't this the whole problem with organized religion? We've all got books that we say are sacred or the word of God, and they're full, amongst other things, of nasty surprises, reasons to attack others who don't share our views, and at their worst, full of commandments not so much to love your neighbor as to despise them. So, some of us say, whenever I hear a bit that I don't like, I get uncomfortable. I might shift in my pew a bit or my chair. I look out of the window or I gaze at the stained glass, if it's that sort of church, and I kind of wish it away. I've never really liked that bit, I think, so I kind of gloss over it. Or I think, well, I don't think he really meant it, and actually no one really thinks it happened like that anyway, so it's okay. I still don't have to tell people at work that I go to church and have them think that I'm a bigot. Or alternatively, I sit still and I listen and I feel kind of wretched and hopeless and try to get my heart back together for the bit at the end when I'm going to have to stand around and have coffee and be nice. If you've ever had a reaction like that to bits of the Bible, be sure that you're not alone. And how Christians read the Bible, how we interpret the Bible, because we all do to one degree or another, is a crucial issue for us. Biblical literacy is arguably at an all-time low. Most of us, we think we know what's in there, but quite often when we actually read it, we're surprised. And most people live their lives without reference to religion and certainly don't read the Bible at all. So have you heard I'm a priest in the Church of England? I'm serving currently at St. James's Church, Piccadilly, right by Piccadilly Circus in London. People in our area are working really, really hard. Long hours in shops, cleaning offices, or then trading commodities in them. In cafes or kitchens, you name it, it's going on in the streets around Soho and Piccadilly at all hours of the day and the night. Piccadilly Circus, and all that that means, is a place that reflects a lot how life is for many people. The lights are on 24-7. It's active, busy, distracted, international. Screens are everywhere. Advertising is king. Our nearest place of worship is the gigantic Apple store on Regent Street, like a cathedral. Street homelessness is high in the borough of Westminster, as is addiction, whether it is to work, alcohol, sex or drugs, cocaine for the hedge fund managers, and heroin for the destitute. So what can that remarkable and, yes, holy collection of stories, histories, poems, laws, letters, visions, and gospels that make up our scriptures say about us IRL, in real life. 
I spend quite a lot of time with people who are pretty dubious about God, extremely dubious about the Bible, don't mind Jesus as long as he stays a historical, radical figure, but are clear that religion is dangerous and the Bible must bear a lot of the blame. Filled, it, filled as it is with violent despots, adulterous kings, and highly suspect visions of dragons and vast whoring women at the end. In a confirmation class in our church last year, the group reported back on the task for that week, which was to read the whole of Mark's gospel in one go. Without exception, the people in the group hadn't wanted to be seen reading the Bible in public. Kendall was just about okay, as long as no one looked over their shoulder on the bus. This hesitancy about the Bible in public is turned to an advantage by an ordained friend of mine who, when he's on a train journey, he often deliberately wears his dog collar, sits at a table, gets out his Bible, and starts muttering to himself. He always gets almost the whole carriage to himself. The Bible has supporters among non-believers of the King James Version. The literary merit puts it up there with Shakespeare. But any suggestion that the Bible has an influence on how we live is seen to be at best misguided and at worst dangerous. The dilemma might be summed up like this. This is an extract from an email sent to me by one of our congregation about their own struggles and desires to believe, but just not being able to deal with the Bible. They wrote, I was brought up in the glow of a Western liberal tradition. I'm a victim of the belief that humankind progresses, and wouldn't it be nice if it evolved according to humane, free, liberal values based on an enlightened, enlightened reading of the Christian message regarding love, peace, service, equality, generosity, empathy, and a benign creation. Genocides, wars, tyrants, persecutions, and capitalism are just blips in the ongoing discovery and journey of understanding. So I can access the Bible by historicizing the text and evolving ever more sophisticated ways to get past the difficult bits. But our Bible, reading from left to right, from top to bottom, in strict numerical order through pages, chapters, and verses, is in the postmodern society fundamentally flawed. The Bible doesn't seem fit for purpose. This is someone who wants to take the Bible seriously, who comes to church and wants to live their faith faithfully. The beliefs and the values that guide our daily living as Christians are often actually in reality independent of the Bible and what it says. That's only a problem if our primary interpretation of the Bible is as a rule book. And so one of the first tasks to ask ourselves is, what do you really actually think of the Bible? We will call it the Word of God, and so it is. But what does that mean in reality? Do you actually deep down think that it is a rule book, even full of ones that you might disagree with? Is it a book that will tell you what to do or what God thinks about a subject? In our church, we have two large boards on which are painted the Ten Commandments. I was walking through the church not long ago, and I saw a man who was visiting the church. He was standing looking at these Ten Commandments. Just as I approached, he sighed and said, Well, I've broken all of those. And just as I was obviously looking a little bit astonished, he said, Oh, except murder. What does it mean that the scripture is God-breathed, as Paul writes in his letter to Timothy? In discussions among Christians, sometimes it's easy to generate more heat than light. Worries about interpreting the Bible are usually described in terms of watering it down, picking and choosing, making it say what you want to say. Or, on the other hand, worries about taking it too literally, ignoring scientific knowledge, being a fundamentalist. 
The truth is that reading the Bible is incredibly simple and immensely complicated all at the same time. So where to start? It isn't incompatible to love Scripture as the Word of God and also to remember that it took quite a long time to be written down at all and that for nearly all of the 2,000 years of Christianity, the Christian Gospels were simply not available to ordinary people like you and me. Only for the last 500 years, a quarter of the time that Christianity has been in existence, European Christians have been able to read the Bible for themselves. Previously translated only into Latin, the scholastic language of the hierarchy, one of the achievements of the Reformation, of course, was that the people of Europe could read the Bible in their own language and take their own meaning from it for themselves, which is why the clergy resisted it. For most of us, the way we encounter the Bible is in short bursts on a Sunday. For some, there is a daily discipline of reading, but again, usually because of time, in short bursts. We might have started to assume that we know it fairly well, and that we assume, therefore, we know what's in it, so we don't really need to keep revisiting it. Actually, reading it in long enough sections that make the stories real is rare. There are two strands of thought that have influenced these set of reflections today, one Christian and one Jewish. The Brazilian Carmelite priest, Carlos Mestres, worked in apartheid South Africa, developing studies of the Bible that engaged communities in movements of nonviolent resistance. And he wrote, the Bible must be read with the head, with the heart, and with the feet. The feet are very important. The Bible was written as the product of a journey. It's only by following with our own feet the same journey that we can get to know all of the meaning of the Bible for us. And this was the journey of the people. We may start at different points, but we arrive together. The struggle is one struggle. And in 1965, Professor Abraham Joshua Heschel, the great Jewish thinker, went to Selma, Alabama, to march with Martin Luther King Jr. in the struggle for civil rights. Someone marching alongside him questioned why he, as an eminent scholar, would come to Selma instead of remaining in New York. Heschel's reply was profound. When I march in Selma, my feet are praying. So, now that we do have the opportunity to read it for ourselves, what could it make mean to read the Bible with our feet? Taking Carlos Mester's three categories, I want to suggest that there are great advantages, but also dangers in our conventional Bible reading. Should we use our head and our heart? Yes, of course. By head, I take this to mean studying the Bible, which is incredibly important. Finding out about the author's intention in choosing the particular words in Hebrew or Greek is hugely influential on the meaning. For example, the word used in Greek in John's Gospel to describe Jesus' shout when he calls Lazarus by name to raise him from the dead is krogadzo. Usually we translate this in church as he cried with a loud voice. It's a rare and old Greek word. But this is the only place it's used to describe the voice of just one person. A few verses later, that word is used to describe the shouting Hosanna of the crowd as Jesus rides into Jerusalem. And even more vividly, the same word is used to describe what we often describe as the baying of the crowd for Barabbas to be set free. This changes for me the imagined scene at Lazarus's tomb. Jesus is shouting, even screaming his name. Now when that gospel is read, I hear Jesus in a totally different way. So good scholarship does this, but it's important to bring that scholarship 
out of the academy and into the believing communities where we're trying to live it. There are some dangers, too, of concentrating on our head when we're reading the Bible. This mistake was made by the great critic of religion, Richard Dawkins. He published the fact that a survey a couple of years ago found that a large percentage of people who called themselves Christians couldn't name the books of the Bible and couldn't say that they'd read it all. He was on Radio 4 with Giles Fraser, the previous speaker here. Giles challenged him live on air to name the full title of the book that he thought of as his Bible, that is, Darwin's Origin of the Species. He couldn't remember the full title, and so Giles enlightened him on the origin of the species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Richard Dawkins finished the exchange in exasperation by exclaiming counterintuitively, oh God. <laughs> this illustrates the mistaken belief that the Bible is a collection of facts to be remembered like a scientific paper. And for Christians, there's plenty of us that even secretly take that approach too. For myself, I've tried to counter that in myself. I've stopped quoting the references for particular stories, even if I know them. Because I realized that it was in fact more about me and whether I knew, whether I wanted to communicate to you that I knew that the Samaritan woman at the well was John 4, or whether the wise men were the second chapter of Matthew. It was much more about my insecurity than what it was about communicating the gospel. And it sounds, if we're constantly talking in those facts and figures type of way about the Bible, like an internal, esoteric, unreachable conversation. One way of illustrating this might be this story. Before I was at St. James's, I was working at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And each year, we took the choristers who were boys aged between 7 and 11, to sing at Canary Wharf in memory of those who were killed in New York on 9-11. There was a day of fundraising for children's charities, and the choristers of St. Paul's started off the day. After the boys had sung to start that day, they went on to the Canary Wharf Tower radio station, which was being uh, piped into all the trading floors and offices for that day, set up just for that day. The DJ, faced with all these very excitable choristers, couldn't really think of what to ask them. So we asked them, so guys, come on, tell our listeners, what's your favorite hymn? 481, <laughs> said one immediately. No, 332, said the other one. No, I like 245 better. The librarian tendencies of us Christians who want to make sure everyone knows what John 3.16 is sounds to those outside like that kind of internal conversation. It traps us in our own version of God's word, which is, as my emailer said before, in English, codified, numbered, reading from left to right, from top to bottom, which, as we all know, is not how life works. So, of course, it helps if we read the Bible with our head. It's important, and the scholarship is there. But there are dangers, too. So does it help if we connect our head with our heart? Yes, of course. Our heart, I take to be a way of describing our emotional life, our deepest needs and desires, sometimes unknown or unacknowledged, the place that we learn to love, and the place that sometimes we hate, and the place where, if we're honest, most of our important decisions are made, even though we think that we're thinking them through. Our heart hears the stories, and we often wrestle with their meaning for us deep down. We wrestle with scripture, like Jacob wrestled with the angel, and this heart reading can have a dramatic effect. Sometimes just a single verse from the Bible seems ordinary until you shake it and shake it until all the words drop off and you're left with a truth that will set you on fire and set you free. And like Jacob, 
we can leave our encounter with Scripture limping, impaired either permanently or temporarily because of our encounter with the truth. At the service for the victims of the South Asian tsunami, Richard Attenborough read from the book of Revelation. His daughter had been killed a few short weeks earlier in the huge wave. And so he read from Revelation, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. That reading has never sounded the same to me since. So our hearts are vital in this scriptural encounter. What's the danger here? The danger is that because our emotions and needs are so powerful and so unavoidably ours, they can become unaccountable and unchallengeable. Scripture says what I say it says because that's what I feel it says. At its very extreme, a leader like David Koresh can manipulate scripture in an unaccountable way as he did at the siege in Waco in Texas, where he said, if you can't kill for Christ, you can't die for Christ, and handed out guns to his followers. So of course it's important to read the Bible with our head and with our heart. What might it mean to read the Bible with our feet? Reading the Bible with your feet means taking your daily life seriously. Not the daily life we describe to others when we're asked, what do you do, do you have a family and so on, where do you live? But the actual daily life that you live night and day, what you eat, where you walk, who you talk to, what you do, what is hurting, where you end up. And this isn't just an individual task, because we take our collective life seriously, the people that we're walking with. We acknowledge that we're always traveling with others, and that the Gospels were written by communities, so should be read in community. Scripture then becomes the text to which we take our text, that is, the experience of our own lives as they are. Lots of people say to me, I'm still trying to work out what to do with my life. And the truth is, what we're doing now with our days, we're already doing with our life. I'm suggesting the phrase, reading the Bible with our feet, because despite our protestations, we do have a tendency, if we try to pray, to invite God into the special times that we've set aside, either in church or by ourselves, when we've got time to do it, when we've got time to perhaps read a bit of the Bible, when we've cleaned our shoes and we've settled down to tell God how it is. We invite God in our prayers into the front room of our lives, and we make the tea, and we make time to talk and listen to what God has to say. But we know, even while we're chatting, that not far away, the kitchen looks like a bomb has hit it. And to be honest, we haven't cleaned the toilet. And we hope to God that we won't have to take God into the bedroom, where our behavior is at its very best and at its very worst. Reading the Bible with our feet means that the murkiness of our own motives, realities, and jealousies are given room and space to breathe with scripture. The underside of our feet, the bits we can't see, but are more apparent to other people than to us. The actions that we take, the paths that we actually follow, not the ones we tell everyone else we follow. It's these that are bathed in the light of scripture. Feet are necessary and real, but in a northern European country, we keep them hidden away. Some of them don't work so well. Some of them have toes we're worried about. Some of them have corns and have gone funny shapes and are just sore. Our feet is a way of describing the life that we're actually living, what we spend our time doing, what we spend our money on, who we travel with, and how fast we're going. 
Our feet carry us forward, and the horizon changes because our place in the landscape has changed. Our feet will march with others in protest, will sometimes wander about uncertainly, will, as we promise at baptism, turn to Christ, and will help us repent, that is, turn around. It's not a solitary journey. With our feet, we also learn to walk in others' shoes. By going and standing over there with that person, we learn compassion and understanding for their point of view and their life. Reading the Bible with our feet makes us unavoidably political with a small p. We won't be able to help it because of the journeys we've made and the companions that we've met along the way. Reading the Bible with our feet means walking the way of the exodus, the story of God's people journeying from slavery to freedom, from oppression to liberation, from war to just peace. And we'll experience over and over again the bewilderment of 40 years in the desert, the complaining and hearkening back to the safe, if confined, slavery of the past. So the question that infuses our interpretation of the Bible when we read it with our feet is, am I, are we, walking the path of the exodus from slavery to freedom? Are we turning and returning to Christ? And finally, when your feet are dusty and bleeding from the path that you've traveled, when the stones have cut your heels and you're blistered and you want to rest, Christ comes and washes those feet, yours, old or young, pedicured, painted or calloused. They will be washed and kissed as his were washed and kissed by the woman we know in Luke's gospel as the sinner from the city. So reading the Bible with our feet can help us with the Bible's difficult and dangerous bits. How? If God's presence in the world is revealed in Scripture, in the history of people, and in a life, the life of Christ, then we shouldn't be surprised at all if in the Bible there are violent bits, muddled bits, contradictory bits. Because that's what my life is like, that's what human life is like, and that's what a diverse creation is like. So God is revealed in the gaps, by the side, in the cracks. And I know, although I don't really want to admit it, that it's in the mistakes that I make and the messes that I get myself into that I learn how to be even a little bit open to the astonishing generosity of God and the demanding call to live. One of the premises of this approach is that we read four Gospels in Scripture, the story of Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection in community, your life, my life, is the fifth Gospel, the story of my relationships, your relationships, your work and home, your sickness and healing, your need for grace, and the indelible mark, like a watermark, of Christ's life, death, and resurrection played out in the events and forgivenesses of your life now. Your life, as it is, is the fifth gospel. And so using the tools of biblical scholarship, it then interacts, it takes its place between and among the other gospels. And just like the other Gospels, there are recognizable stories of God's presence in the world, the story of Jesus in a life, that have details different from the others. There are bits I've embellished, things I've remembered or half remembered. And so the interaction between my life's Gospel and the scriptural Gospels gives us the phrase, the living word. As Christians, one of the terrible things we often try to do, even though we say we don't, is that we try to reverse Christmas. We try over and over again to turn flesh back into the word again. We love our rules and we love our certainties 
And this happens in every form of worship, every branch of the church. We love our norms and our acceptabilities, not remembering that Jesus is transgressive of any boundaries we might like to set up, always confronting and surprising, bringing healing and peace. Last week on Thursday morning, we had our normal Eucharist service, communion service in the church. At our church, located where we are in the early morning, there are all the sounds you might expect from a central London street. The beep of the street cleaning trucks, the shouting of the delivery men, the drilling of the ubiquitous builders, the monotony of stationary traffic. And inside the church, we say our prayers accompanied by the snoring, sometimes very loud snoring, of homeless guests who sleep in our pews each day and sleep through our morning services. There were two stories from the Bible that were read out in that service. The first was from the book of Judges. Jephthah makes a vow to God. If God will help him in his battle against the Ammonites, Jephthah will sacrifice the first thing he sees on his return. Jephthah wins the battle, returns home, and the first thing he sees is his daughter. The story continues that he keeps his vow and sacrifices his daughter after she spent three months at her request in the desert, bewailing the fact that she will never have children. At the end of the reading, I wanted to shout, no, but I was taking the service, so I thought I probably shouldn't. <laughs> if I'm reading the Bible with my head, I will say, this is a story of its time. Jephthah does what many men of faith do and makes a vow to God before battle. We tend not to make these kinds of vows now, but it illustrates the historic misogyny of some of the scriptures. My head will interpret this, but in doing so, will mask the horror of the effort of building a pile of wood, the terror of a bound young woman killed with a knife and then burned. A feminist scholar will call out rage from any right-thinking human being if this story is presented as any kind of example to follow. If I'm reading the Bible with my feet, I will walk right into this story and say to myself, as a person of faith, when have I made hubristic and cruel statements like Jephthah in the name of faith, regardless of the hurt it may have caused someone else? When have I bargained with God or found ringing phrases that make me look like a faithful person that's ended up with someone else getting burned? When have I assumed that what God is asking me to do is throw on the pyre something I love? And when have I seen someone's simple freedom and humanity as expendable in the service of a supposedly higher goal that drives me on. I will turn my rage into action then, so that what I learn from this cruel vow is energizing to help me confront cruelty in myself, but especially towards others in society today. If that wasn't enough, the second reading from the gospel at the same service was from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is telling one of his weird stories, and he is, as he often is, suitably dramatic and compelling. A king's son is getting married. Immediately, the crowd are listening, imagining all kinds of grandeur and celebration. None of the people invited come. They all refuse. Total shock among his listeners. No one would do that. It's unforgivably rude. So the king's household go into the highways and byways and make all kinds of people come in, and the gospel very carefully says, both good and bad. Well, that's a bit far-fetched, his hearers are thinking. Well, still, let's stick with it. According to the customs of the time, wedding robes would be handed to the guests as they arrive. But the king spots someone who hasn't got one. Perhaps he refused to put it on. So he has him bound, hand and foot, and thrown into outer darkness with wailing and gnashing of teeth. 
And unless there's any doubt, as the late Ian Paisley used to say, teeth will be provided. So our head does all that, what we would call exegesis. My heart is completely overtaken that this story is in the Bible. Someone in the image of God being thrown out because they don't have the right clothes. Do I, do I really want a religion that has any wailing or gnashing of teeth or outer darkness? But if I read this story with my feet, then I'm questioned and confronted by this story. When have I refused to believe that it is even me that's invited? When have I been unable to accept the invitation to celebrate the astonishing gift of life itself, this meal, these people, this table? When have I thought to myself, I just can't go, I don't know what to wear, I'll just keep my head down and hope that no one notices. I will then want to walk the walk and consistently ask myself with others to accept that we are invited and that the irresistible invitation is to live and to celebrate the life that's ours. That morning, there was a part of me that didn't really want those bits read out. Did I have a tussle inside me about whether a religion of which I am a public representative should contain these violent and on the surface judgmental stories? But I also know that the disruptive power of these gospel stories are much more effective, more transformative in the language of desperation than the language of harmony. If I crave stability and security and to be told over again that things are going to be okay, then truthfully, Christianity is not really for me. If we try to explain everything away with our heads or rail against it in our hearts, we betray our wish for a neater God, a surer-footed God, who may well hold the whole world in his hands, but who is, as we learn in Holy Week, poured out into that world in, cr in the crucified Christ, and every day is bound and gagged like that guest and destroyed like Jephthah's daughter by the hubris of humanity. We can't somehow disallow discomfort because discomfort is where God is especially and crucially present. One more example of these difficult bits of the Gospels. It is part of the human condition, although a part that we don't really want to visit that often, that we have parts of us that remain inconsolable. And so the deep wisdom of the Christian tradition is that straight after Christmas, with its newborn tenderness and with everything before us, we mark just three days later the slaughter of the innocents. Herod's possibly mythical order to kill all the infant boys under two in an attempt to murder Jesus. Reading this horrifying story with our head will mean that we recognize the parallels in Matthew with Pharaoh's attack on Moses' generations earlier. For me, although it's an interesting project to investigate the historicity or not of this terrible event, it doesn't make too much difference to my faith whether it happened as it said or not because it happens now. The incomprehensible murder of 132 children in Peshawar by Taliban gunmen last year is all the evidence we need to make this gospel real. Other scholars will be clear to say that Herod the Great was a singularly cruel ruler and carried out casual executions and massacres more than once, so it's perfectly possible as a historical reality. Reading this story, however, with our feet will mean that we acknowledge the truth of this in the world today and we vow not to walk away because the world is full of uncomforted mothers and fathers and uncomforted children. 
our mature spirituality will acknowledge before God that there are some traumas that will not mend in this life. There are some griefs that will never be comforted. Walking into this story, we discover that even there, in the sulfurous shame and fear that forms whatever is inconsolable in us, Christ is still born, even there, even and while we remain uncomforted. Christ is born in the vulnerability of a baby and with the light and the power of the sun. Last year, I was talking to two refugees who've come to the UK and have joined our congregation. They have permission to stay because of the horrific experiences they've endured in their home country. They've been attending our church, having had no experience of Christianity before, but having heard of Jesus. And they've simply asked to learn more, particularly about Jesus. Our conversations have been incredibly moving for me, as neither of them read well in their own languages, let alone English. We're telling the stories through an interpreter. We're telling the stories of the Gospels. And we're all telling stories of our own lives, noticing the links and the wisdom contained in both. The freshness with which they approach these stories is extraordinary. A few months ago, we ate mustard seeds together and talked about why Jesus would have said that they were like the kingdom of God. We looked at a coin and told the story that Jesus said the kingdom of God was like a woman searching for a coin that she'd lost in her house. She sweeps every room looking for what she'd lost searching and searching, eventually she finds it, and she's so delighted that she calls her neighbors to celebrate with her. As I told the story, I looked up at the interpreter who was interpreting for us to find her face streaming with tears. I'd finished by saying, God is like this, the woman searching for you until you are found. She said directly in English, I am lost, before translating it for the others. If we take seriously the reality of our own life and walk into the story of the Gospels, then sometimes some surprising reflections come. In the story of the Good Samaritan, as we discussed it, not one of the most traditionally difficult parts of Scripture, the feet part obviously means that we actively find ways to get involved in the action of the Samaritan, the binding up and the helping of those who are in trouble, whoever they are. It's not difficult to do this, to put our faith into action in this way. Lots of ways to volunteer or to give away excess clothes and shoes to buy socks for those who are destitute in the winter. It's really not difficult to do this. But to take my life seriously, too, will lead to another set of reflections with another set of actions. You will know that the Lash community, who often are at Greenbelt, consisting of people with learning disabilities and assistance, often act out parables. In the Canterbury community, where I spent some time and lived some years ago, the story of the Good Samaritan was being acted out. The woman playing the Good Samaritan duly went up to the person left for dead by the robbers and mopped his brow with the water and the cloth that they'd practiced. She then took the, the man to the innkeeper, handed over the money for the board and lodging, and also wiped the brow of the innkeeper. Then to everyone's surprise, but in a profound extension of the parable, she went and found the robbers hiding behind a rock and wiped their brows and took care of them. In that instant, she expanded the meaning by her actions, by walking into the story. It occurs to me too, if I walk into this story, then there are times when I'm asked to be a good neighbor, not only to a stranger, but to myself. What are the hurt left for dead bleeding parts of yourself, that the busy, purposeful you hurries past in an effort to get on with the day. And for any of us who are ordained, 
it's as well for us to remember that one of the persons who hurried past was a priest. Reading the Bible with our feet allows us to make the stories our own, but also as we travel asks us to listen, to allow the story to discomfort us and shock us. Jesus is on his way to Jairus' house, the leader of the synagogue. On the way, surrounded by a crowd, a woman pushes through, hoping to be healed of 12 years of hemorrhaging. She can only touch the edge of his robe. Jesus turns as he says, somebody touched me. No one had called that woman somebody before. She was a nobody, untouched, unspoken to, and lonely. She's restored not only to health, but to society. So far, so good. We can sign up to that. Jesus healing marginalized people. It's familiar. And if we struggle to, even if we struggle to live it, we know that's what the gospel says. But immediately after this, Jesus carries on his journey to Jairus' house, and he heals the daughter of the very man whose life is dedicated to enforcing the purity code that kept the woman apart. Why? Because the man enforcing that code is invited too into a new way of living by Jesus. His humanity is as important to Jesus as hers. His story is as precious to Jesus as hers. And the invitation is made through healing and love. The gospel according to Jairus may have turned out very differently. As soon as we want to claim Jesus... When we read the Bible with our feet, Jesus eludes us. As soon as we want to claim Jesus, and miraculously, he agrees with everything I think, Jesus moves. How many times in the Gospels do you read that everyone's looking for Jesus? They can't find him. He's been up the mountain praying all night. He's had to get into a boat because the crush on the shore is so great. The crowd try to throw him over a cliff at Nazareth, but he escapes. They try to grab him and make him a king, but he slips away into the hills, we read. It's in his own time and at his own instigation that he sets his face towards Jerusalem and goes to the city. He remains and will always remain free from the spiritual, theological, even cultural scaffolding that we construct around our Christ. There's an urgency about Christ, talking constantly about the kingdom of God being near, upon, within you, the new realm. Some techniques that have helped me read the Bible with my feet and walk with that elusive Christ reading a whole gospel at a time, and answering the question, who is Jesus in this gospel? Reading the book of Job in as big chunks as possible. Never read a psalm except as a whole. And contemplate imaginatively the gospel stories, reading it slowly three times. The first time, what strikes you? The second time, the sentence that strikes you, the third time, walk into the story. The Lent program at our church attempted to stimulate something of this kind of reflection this year. It was called Loitering Within Lent, a program where we asked members of our congregation to come with us to spaces in society that we may have never been before to the public gallery at the Old Bailey Criminal Court, to a TV studio to watch a recording of a TV program, to a Hindu temple, and an urban reflective retreat in the streets around Soho and Piccadilly called Street Wisdom. The Gospels are all around us, the stories of heroes and failures, of inequalities and justice, and as the prophecy says, a little child will lead us. One of the most famous paintings of Pablo Picasso is the simplest. When he was criticized for the utter simplicity of the line drawing of the dove that's now recognized as an international symbol of peace, he said, it may be a simple drawing now, but you didn't see all the other doves I drew in order to get to that one. It took me four years to paint like Raphael, he said, but a lifetime to paint like a child. 
It's a lifetime's work to learn to live the simplicity of the Bible. And a lot of elaborate and necessary, complicated reflection can go on before we do. But the most important thing we can do is commit to the travel. In the end, we'll stop trying to read the Bible and let the Bible read us as we either walk purposefully or wander through life. The Gospels read us, and we find that we're contemplated there and invited into a future we could never imagine for ourselves. And we will, precisely because of that hemorrhaging woman, because of the man stuck in futile, repetitive behavior for 38 years at Bethesda, because of the soldiers and the prison guards, the collaborating tax collectors and the zealous revolutionaries, the foolish fathers and the brave daughters, precisely because of the lives that are lived in those pages, give you the courage to know that your life is the fifth gospel, wherever your feet have led you so far. Life intertwined with Christ's life is the fifth gospel, discomforted or comforted, inconsolable or consoled. Whether you identify as gay, bisexual, straight, lesbian, trans, and all of those of you who are not sure or don't know what your label is, if you're rich or poor, single, partnered, married or curious, whether you've come here on your legs, with sticks, in a wheelchair, or carried in the arms of somebody else, whatever your age or ethnicity or experience, your life is the fifth gospel, whether you're in work or out of work, with a criminal record or a victim of crime, whether you are grieving, glad, anxious, contented, or despairing, if your mental health is robust or fragile, if you're lonely or in love, or pregnant, or wish you were, or worry that you don't want to be, if you're afraid of getting older or feeling that you're too young, your life is made sacred in the Gospels because they are God's commitment and challenge to us, whoever we are, whoever we come from. The scripture is full of these people, and you are full of scripture. Every person, whatever I've done, whatever mess I'm in, whether I'm up a tree like Zacchaeus or working hard like Martha, if you're caught in a relationship you don't like or a job you want to leave, whoever you want to be, whoever you think you should be by now, the Bible is there for us to walk into to walk with, to wrestle with, and always to pray with others as you go.